Okay, so welcome everyone. Uh, today, yeah, today it's um, it's a special day because we have uh, some some people from informal systems who are going to uh, to show a presentation and a demo of um, Quint, their the specification language that uh, they've been working on and how they used it uh, to specify ICS twenty. Uh, so we're going to try to make uh, all the updates and discussions that we need to do approximately in 20 minutes so that um, uh, yeah we have enough time for the presentation and the demo if that's okay yeah of course really okay. interesting to see. thank you all right so yeah last week uh, the ibc team in, uh, from interchain uh, we were in a retreat um, discussing roadmap and team processes uh, so the progress has been relatively slow the last couple of weeks due to these and holidays and paternity leaves, etc. Um, but yeah, uh, we can we can give a bit of an update. Um, so Susanna, if you want to start with the product from the product side, um, yeah. So I mean, we were mostly doing preparation for the retreat. Um, Addy, I don't know if he's here. Did a really nice session on uh, optimistic rollups and how this could be relevant for IBC. And then we just like spent a bit of time looking at like the context that IBC exists within and how actually maybe we still have a bit further to go to be an interoperability standard, given like the size of where we are today and where we want to be. But that's obviously OK. Um, but yeah, just other product updates. Um, we're just working on finalizing the content that will go into the updated IBC protocol website and there should be a blog post coming out either later this week or early next week on ADRH. Cool, thanks Susanna. <clears throat> then from protocol and engineering, um, yeah, we've been reviewing and merging many PRs that were open by external contributors. Um, and then we've been working on yeah the different release lines that uh, uh, yeah that we're working on. Um, so in order of release number uh, for six point two, uh, yeah we've been working together with FMOS uh, to backport the support for OC uh, to transfer to to this release line, and also they opened a the PR uh, to add support for unlimited spend limit. Uh, uh, so you can yeah so you so with this PR that the FMOS uh, opened, you will be able to use the maximum value of um, of a uint two five six uh, as a sentinel value to specify that you don't yeah you want to do unlimited spending. So the the amount will not be the spended limit will not be subtracted uh, uh, anymore. Uh, it will just stay the same. Um, yeah. So that's something that's come out, gonna come out in this release. Uh, for 7.1, which is the release with the uh, local host client, uh, yeah, um, shout out to Justin, uh, who found uh, a bug that we had in our um, CLI, transfer CLI. And uh, yeah, Damian uh, did a great work investigating where the problem was. And, and we already, he already uh, opened a PR uh, with a fix. So that should be, yeah, that should be fine now. Um, well, maybe Damien, if you want to explain a bit um, what the problem was and how you solve it. Yeah, it's just that like the transfer CLI has uh, the ability to use like absolute timeouts and relative timeouts. And when it uses relative timeouts, it tries to do a consensus state lookup and the local host client doesn't have any notion of a consensus state. So we just kind of have to accommodate for that. Yeah, cool. Yeah, thanks, uh, Damien. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, then uh, another feature that we want to include in this release <clears throat> is to add a state entry in transfer to keep track of the total amount of tokens that are added in the escrow accounts. So we are also wrapping up this feature. Uh, that was requested by osmosis for the rate limiting 
yeah so we're trying to to finish the the last bit bits of this um then we have another feature that we wanted to include in this release but we might not um, be able to include it uh, because there are still some uh, things that are not clear <clears throat> how to move forward um, and it's about uh, yeah is the issue is about adding json encoding to the transactions that are included in the interchain accounts packet data the transactions that, that you send from the controller to the host um, so we wanted to add json encoding um, because this would be yeah make life easier for custom wasm developers uh, but we 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 got some feedback um and um yeah it's not clear how this json encoding should be done uh for for once on one side uh, if we if we rely on the protobuf json that might that that encoding could change in the future apparently um they they are uh, yeah they want to be flexible to perform breaking changes in the future so if we use that one uh, the encoding uh, could break <clears throat> so another option is maybe just to use regular json uh, that we are investigating uh, but if somebody has any feedback or any thoughts about this um, yeah, we would appreciate if you could share it with us in the either in the issue or in any other channel. Um, yeah, so that we can make an yeah an informed decision about how to move forward with this one. All right, uh, so that's seven point one. Most likely, the support for the JSON encoding will be released later, since the first two features should be done. Probably this iteration we should be able to to release. All right, and then uh, for V8, yeah, we're continuing the work with uh, channel upgradeability. Um, there's a PR open to update the specs uh, with the changes that Aditya has um, drafted. Uh, to handle uh, in-flight packets uh, so that packets um, before finishing an upgrade all the in-flight packets are uh, processed so that uh, packet life cycle is completed uh, either with a timeout or an acknowledgement before uh, new packets uh, with the new channel um, uh, channel properties uh, are uh, sent <clears throat> So we're trying to uh, yeah finish that work on the spec and the implementation um, then continue with the yeah focusing on the try step and then continuing with the acknowledgement and confirm steps uh, any questions so far from all this all the work for these releases No, all right. All right. Then um, I haven't I haven't put it here, but maybe it's worth mentioning that uh, yeah, uh, we will probably start next iteration, so around two weeks time, uh, to start reviewing the PR um, that Strange Love has opened with the Watson clients. So we will most likely start reviewing that uh, yeah uh, in a couple of weeks. All right, and then for path and winding. Yeah, we are leaning towards implementing this feature in transfer directly. Um, if you haven't already, uh, please have a look at uh, Aditya's write-up uh, in the discussion in the IBC spec repo, uh, where he lists uh, the different options and the pros and the cons of each. Um, and if anybody has any feedback, uh, please also share it there. And so that we can also make a good decision. All right, so that's a bit um, all our updates. Uh, if there are no questions, then let's move to the relayer teams from Hermes. Uh, is Luca here maybe? Yep. Yeah, hi Luca. Hey, uh, so on Hermes side, we've been focusing on improving the performance. So this includes improving profiling and uh, metrics. Okay. 
to the main focus. I guess mm, there hasn't been any progress on channel availability in the last few weeks, right? Uh, it's a bit uh, on hold. Yes, we have the init step and we're waiting for the new try step to continue the work. So I'm okay. monitoring the different uh, PRs you have open. Okay, cool. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> All right. Uh, if nothing else, look at then from the relay team, uh, Justin. Uh, we've had a few improvements around the logs. Like some of the logs have been fairly generic. So we've been working on providing more insightful error messages and whatnot. Um, we've been seeing a lot more open source contributors lately. So we've had a few people improving some of the CLI commands. Um, we have somebody that's working on adding the actual um, fee middleware commands to the relay. So you'll be able to like register your forward and backward um, pay account. I think a lot of the work that we've been doing has been preparing for the multi-hop support that Polymer is working on, as well as working with Penumbra to ensure that the Go Relay works with Penumbra. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. Um, um, all right, cool. Um, thanks, Justin. Yeah. And thanks for yeah, reporting that back um, uh, for the local host client. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. I'm hoping to have that completely squared away by the end of the week. So, like, I saw. ICS20 transfers were working. I'm going to just kind of make sure that it works well, it's under stress, and that things like timeouts and various edge cases do work as well. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks. Cool. Um, then, uh, from other updates or topics, uh, anything anybody would like to discuss? Maybe, uh, Steve, do you want to mention anything about Wasm clients? Uh, no, there's there's no additional updates for the Wasm Light client. All right, then I guess just for a like small update uh, mm -hmm. on the request of like um, I guess informal, we are adding a uh, API to be able to get the uh, um, the denominations for IBC coins directly uh, from the uh, base denom and uh, the port ID and the channel. So you don't need to replicate code uh, in your own applications to reproduce the denoms if you if you need to uh, reproduce them, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah thanks, Sardar. Yeah, we have this, Sardar opened this PR, so we can link it here, uh, like this one here, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, and the good thing is it's not like um, affecting the state or even the uh, process any process at all, so you could just uh, integrate it and it will always work. So you can add that retroactively as well. Cool, thanks. Yeah. All right, then it's okay if we move to the presentation by informal. If nobody has any other topics. All right, thanks. Then uh, Igor, if you want to start, uh, let me allow to share the screen. Probably I need to do that. Oh, yeah, so I'm actually going to screen share. Yeah. All right, so you should be able to share the screen now. Let me stop this. I'm just giving a talk from Thomas's computer. Perfect. Can you see the screen? Yes. Perfect. Cool. Yeah. Thanks a lot for, for giving us this opportunity to explain to you what we have been doing with Quint and ICS20. I'll just give you a brief introduction into all this effort of, of inventing the new specification language. 
and then Thomas and Gabriella, they will give you a demo. So why have we, have we been developing this, uh, this specification language? So I think that we want to make uh, the markdown documents and the specification documents that live somewhere on the internet, on GitHub, we want to make them live. We want them uh, execu executable, and we want them to bring you more value than just uh, when you are just reading them. That's the whole idea of it. So why is it good? It's good because you can uh, do a lot of things about executable specifications. First of all, you can simulate them. And this gives you some abilities to experiment with your protocols without even implementing them. Uh, it should give you a faster time to, uh, for onboarding because you don't have to read a lot of code. You should just read, should be able to read the protocol and understand what's going on. Uh, second point, of course, the executable, as we say, uh, but it also means that they're testable. You can uh, run tests against uh, against the protocol themselves, uh, which is a replacement for, for what people usually do on a whiteboard. Uh, the third point is that uh, the assumptions become implicit, so you can model the network time and faults and all other things that are usually left uh, out of, of a protocol description. And uh, the cool thing for us, and maybe for you, is that uh, you actually can use static analysis tools uh, on these protocol descriptions, which you cannot do with English, right? Uh, so how do we do that? Uh, I, I'm, I'm just giving you a few screenshots, and then uh, Thomas and Gabriel are going to show you the, the actual uh, token tools. Just stay with me for a couple of minutes. So what they are doing here, the idea is that you have uh, a VS Code plugin where you're, you're writing down your specification uh, instead of writing Markdown. And uh, this is some kind of a language that looks uh, like a programming language, but it's not only a programming language. So you're writing your specifications in, in VS Code, but what's interesting here, you also can execute them in VS Code. You just run the terminal, you run, rep, run REPL, and you can um, uh, experiment with your protocol. So why is it good? that we can do things in VS Code because you get all the standard features of integrated development environments and of programming languages. You have photo completion, you have syntax highlighting, you, you get reference documentation and all the standard things that you basically expect when you're writing code in contrast to, to English specifications and pseudocode. So the next thing you can do, as I, as I told you already, you can debug your protocols in, in REPL, in an interactive environment. And again, Thomas will show you like a real thing. This is just a screenshot. Uh, basically what you do, you can submit some transactions or execute some actions and observe uh, the states that you have, uh, that, uh, uh, that you, you get after executing some of these transactions or actions. So that lets you to debug your protocols interactively instead of trying to debug them in your head. Then uh, another cool thing that, uh, that we find very important is that you can actually write tests against these protocols. So these are not the tests for your implementations, but these are the tests for, for the protocols themselves. And these tests are similar to sequence diagrams or, or sequence charts, if you have seen them before. Basically, you give uh, a sequence of steps uh, with concrete or not concrete inputs, and then the tool is trying to replace this, uh, replace the sequences. And if it doesn't find a violation, it reports that all tests have passed, uh, very much like you have it in in unit testing frameworks. And you see an example here, which again Thomas will show you later live. Uh, and, and the last thing, uh, last important thing is that actually not only you can uh, play with these protocols and execute them somehow, you can also get uh, the examples, the executions uh, produced by the simulator. You can uh, get them into, in, in JSON format. We have this informal trace format, which is a very simple uh, form of JSON. And these traces in principle, you should be able to use in order to, to test your actual implementation. We haven't connected uh, uh, these traces to any any testing framework yet, but if somebody is interested, we can we can talk about it. So this basically finishes uh, finishes this short presentation. And what I want to say that uh, with Quint, we 
we have uh, this language that should work for different kind of people. First of all, it should work for engineers. We have an execution environment, uh, which is written in TypeScript. And this execution environment supports testing and fuzzing. It supports random simulation. Uh, there is an interactive, interactive debugger, uh, which is basically a REPL. But also the same protocol description should work for security auditors and protocol designers. And depending on how far you want to go in the correctness and the correctness efforts, either you just stay simple things like testing and fuzzing and interactive debugging, or you can go further and do more complicated uh, things like model checking and symbolic execution. So that's basically the whole idea. If you want to see Quint, uh, just go on, on the GitHub page, uh, download the VS Code plugin, write tutorials, and if you have any questions, just contact us. We have uh, the Quint Zulip stream, just connect and, and ask questions. But now it's time for the most interesting thing. It's actually the demo, demo time. And I switch over to, to Thomas. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Igor. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Thomas. And um, together with my colleague, Gabriela, um, I've put um, the spec of ICS20 in Quint, which should kind of like serve as a demo of, of how you could use Quint um, in, in IBC related work. So let me just take you um, through a, a bit of the source code of the spec, just to kind of highlight some features of how, how Quint looks and how you can write specifications in Quint. So the first thing to notice here, like, so our specification starts with some type definitions, and this is kind of the very similar already to, to the pseudocode you would see in, in the Markdown spec, right? So, so we have this like fungible token data, which kind of like is the, the IBC uh, packet payload. Then we have like IBC packets, which contain like ports and channels and, and the, the usual stuff you would expect. And then we have acknowledgements, uh, which you also know from IBC. And then kind of the, the main uh, thing here uh, is we have this type chain state. that contains a more abstract view than you would have in the implementation of the state of one chain. So, so we have like this bank field. There's just a mapping from accounts to to amounts and denominations. We have the channels that the chain is connected to, and we have a mapping of, of escrow addresses because that's used in, in transfer. And then we have kind of a few fields that, that keep track of the, of, of the IBC packets um, that are in flight. And then if we scroll down a bit, um, we have the actual like implementation of the, of the protocol logic. So here we have sent fungible tokens. And again, this is very similar to, to what you see in, um, uh, in, in the pseudocode in, in the Markdown spec, right? Um, the big advantage that I want to point out here is like that this is actually um, a, a, a language uh, that has a parser, that has a type checker, that has a, even an effect checker that makes sure that you are updating your variables in a way that makes sense. So I could, for example, like, let's say I'm, I'm really bad at typing and I uh, mistype something here, right? So you, this acts as you would expect from your um, standard IDE. You get the red squiggly line that tells you if you've mistyped this variable name. Um, same if I, for example, introduce a type error, um, pass like a uint instead of a uh, denomination here it will highlight this call and tell you uh, this type error here. Um, so that's that's one benefit that you get on top of uh, pseudocode is get actually a um, language that has the usual tooling around the language front end. Okay, so let's fix this. Uh, so our specification works. And then I would like to touch on the second point, which is exploring um, this spec in an interactive fashion. So in this spec, we, we kind of, we have written down um, the, the main functions that occur in, in ICS20. So you have send fungible tokens, right? And again, you will see that like the logic in here is no different than, than what you have in the Markdown spec. Um, you have like the on receive packet callback. That's also like the same logic. You, you 
check the genome trace, whether like the token is traveling forward or backward. And then you either you escrow or you mint coins. Um, so that's very similar. Um, but what Quint allows you to do is it allows you to explore this protocol interactively. And it, even in the design stage before having any implementation, uh, like without setting up multiple chains and running them, you can play around with the protocol and, and kind of like test your assumptions about the protocol, check whether it's working correctly. So the way you do this is you can um, kind of bring up the Quint repo and I will tell it to um, pass um, this Quint specification file and a module in there that's called ICS20 test. Um, so we will bring up this repo and then kind of the first thing we have to do is um, set up some initial state in which we want to start our protocol. Um, so in this in the, in the spec, we have this action in it. And what this um, action does is it kind of creates a very simple uh, setup of three chains that are called A, B, and C that are connected to each other via IBC channels. And we can actually inspect this uh, the state of the system right now. Um, so for example, uh, so we have this variable chain states and we can inspect how the chain state of chain A looks like. Um, so initially, so we start in an initial state that where we have an account that's called Alice. And uh, uh, so the bank module tells us that this account Alice holds uh, 100 tokens of a denomination Atom. And then we have also like set up like various Astro addresses and we have IBC channels um, to the two other chains. And you can see that there's no acknowledgements or packets in flight. And now um, let's, let's create an IBC packet, right? Let's, let's make a transfer. Um, so we do this by calling the send packet action. And we say we want to send tokens from, from chain A to chain B. We pass a denomination atoms. So let's pass one atom. Let's say we pass this one atom from Alice on chain A to Bob on chain B. So let's run this. And so what this action will do, it will actually like call the um, send fungible token uh, function um, in the Quint spec, and it will update uh, the state of your protocol accordingly. So if we go back and like um, inspect the, the chain state on chain A again, what should have happened is according to ICS20, right? That we moved one token from Alice's account into the escrow account. And so the thing that REPL lets you do is you can kind of test this assumption now, right? So, so we can see that Alice now has only 99 tokens and we have this escrow account that um, received a single token. We also can see that we have created a IBC packet that's an out packet and that kind of contains all of the data that you would expect uh, from this packet. Um, one thing to note here is like we have only like done the part on the sending chain, right? We have created the packet, but it has not been received on the on the um, destination chain. And we can check this by looking into the chain state of chain B, right? So here nothing should have happened yet because we have not processed. Uh, the, the packet has not been relayed or it has not been received yet. So as you can see, like, like we have an empty bank because there's, there's no accounts on this chain yet. And there's also no packets uh, on, on chain B yet. Uh, so as a second step, we can now say, let's receive this packet on chain B. And this is a very simple action that just says, let's receive a packet that's traveling from chain A to chain B. Let's execute this. And this will call the on receive packet callback on, on the receiving chain in our protocol spec. And now we can again double check that what we expected to happen happened, that Bob has been minted his vouchers. And one, one thing that, that a lot of people um, kind of struggle with when they start looking at transfers, is denomination traces, right? And here you can see that Bob has been minted uh, one token, but it's no longer just like 
this base denomination atom, but it actually contains the denomination trace of destination channel and port uh, that would usually be encoded in the slash, like slash uh, separated string. Um, so um, the second thing that happens when we receive the packet on chain B is that we create an acknowledgement. So we can actually see this acknowledgement uh, uh, incoming on chain A. Uh, but again, it has not been received yet. So what we see here, when I look at the chain state of chain A again, is that now we have this like received but unacknowledged packets. Um, oh no, let me, this is actually in acknowledgement. This is what we're looking at. So we, we have this incoming acknowledgement that says transfer was successful. Uh, and uh, therefore the error message is empty and it's referring to the packet that we originally sent. And so we could, could now let, like call, call another action that kind of receives this uh, acknowledgement. But since this was a successful transfer, um, it would not actually trigger any additional logic. Um, there's even more stuff specced uh, in, in, in this Quint specification. So, so we have handling for failed uh, acknowledgements and we have handling of um, timeouts. Um, but the main point I want to make here is uh, you can use Quint and the wrapper to interactively play with the protocol. Even in the design stage, you can uh, kind of like send around packets. You can see what, what's happening in the application logic and on chain. Um, another point I want to make is now we have, we had to kind of like do of all, all of this like interactively. We had to type it in, 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 the, in the Quint wrapper, um, but actually, uh, Quint supports something that is called runs, and, and we kind of can uh, do everything we now did interactively, we can actually write down in code. So if we take this example, this is kind of like a very simple test that transfers tokens across um, three chains, kind of in a circle, and then transfers them back, and we can write this in code. So what we say here is like, well, first, um, call this in init action again that will set up an initial protocol state. And then we make a couple of transfers, right? So say send transfer from A to B, then send a transfer from B to C, uh, and so forth. And what these, what these tests actually allow you to do is they allow you to um, also write assertions in between that will, when we run the test, uh, the Quint simulator will check these assertions and make, uh, verify that these assertions hold um, along this trace that we are specifying. Um, so let's do this right now. I will exit the Quint wrapper and instead run a Quint test. I have to give it the module name again in which it looks for the tests and the um, specification file. And so this will now um, take a bit of time. But the reason why this takes a bit of time is that you have non-determinism in your specs usually, right? So, so for example, if, if you're receiving a packet, um, since this is an unordered channel, there might be any number of packets in flight. And uh, what the Quint specification says is non-deterministically pick one of these packets. Um, and the way the Quint simulator, uh, simulator runs these tests is very similar to property-based testing. It just tries to randomly resolve non-determinism and it runs a lot of tests uh, to make sure that it covers a reasonable amount of the um, state space. Uh, so let's wait a few more seconds here. There's actually four tests in the spec um, also containing failed acknowledgement and containing timeouts. Um, and this is very similar to what you would write as, as a unit test for your implementation or a property-based test for your um, implementation. Just taking a bit longer than I expected. I wonder if I broke something when I was editing the spec before. Um, but essentially this would give you, this should give you like, what you expect from a standard unit test, it just says, yeah, I ran this test and it returned okay. Um, 
So another thing that that I want to show you is um, like kind of like like make a point of of what we found in in writing this spec. And so one thing is um, the quint actually allows you to ah there we go. So now it returns. And as you can see, like, like a property based test, this doesn't just like run one trace, but it actually does um, quite a large number of tests to make sure that it um, resolves all of the non determinism and covers as many cases as possible. Um, so, one thing that this allows you to do, this kind of like, like stress testing your specs, is it allows you to test your assumptions about the protocol. And what we did in, in writing this spec, for example, so, so as I said, like a lot of people get denomination traces wrong or struggle with understanding how they work. And, and uh, so, so one thing we did just like exploratory is we said, okay, okay like, because if you do this like transfer along a uh, uh, sequence of chains and then you transfer back, right? You want to make sure that you can get minted the, the original base denomination back. We said, okay, th does this always hold? Or can we use kind of, can we drive the Quint simulator in, in, in a direction um, but this actually breaks? And so um, we have this one test in here. Um, this is one channels tests. And the way this is written is, uh, so we again have these three chains and we pass a token along the chains then send it back. Uh, but this violates one, one central assumption of, of ICS20, which is that like from the viewpoint of a single chain, its outgoing channel names are unique. And as you can see, if, if we leave out this assumption and we have duplicate channels, um, this assertion at the end of this test that says, okay, we should end up with a denomination trace that's again empty. And this was violated. And, and in this case, like the simulator finds this very quickly. Um, when we fix this assumption, so we have a second test in here that uh, kind of enforces this unique channel naming. Um, we can, let me start this one. That enforces unique channel naming. We can again um, run the simulator. And now we can see this is passing. So this is kind of the third point I want to make is uh, it allows you to write not just happy paths, but also failing behaviors. And it allows you to validate your assumptions about the protocol you're specifying. Um, and then uh, as a final thing, when we run these tests, it's not just that, that we kind of run them in the simulator and get a binary passing or failing output, but we can also um, produce traces uh, from running the tests. Um, these traces will be output in what we call ITF traces, uh, which is informal trace format, but it's really just a, a JSON uh, representation of the steps that the protocol makes. And we also have kind of a VS Code plugin for this. Uh, so you can, uh, this, this is the successful case where we, where we transfer across three chains. And you can, here you can really nicely see how the denom denomination trace is extended when you send the token forward and then how it gets shorter again when you transfer it back. And then in the end, we have this like passing assertion in this case that the, that the denomination trace is empty. And this actually allows you to kind of connect this abstract specification to implementation, right? You could use this uh, JSON trace to drive, for example, an integration test or an end-to-end -end test. So this actually uh, brings me to the end of this demo. Um, I hope you took some nice points from this. As I said, I haven't covered everything that's in the spec. Um, and I encourage you to look it up, to play with it. It's on GitHub in informal systems slash quint. And we also have a public Zulip channel that you can use to ask any questions. Also, I'm happy to take questions um, right now. Is, uh, can you, okay. 
Uh, can you try also to show the failing test with the verbosity equals three, just so we can see the trace in the terminal? Oh, yeah. Um, so, right. So I had this failing test before, right? And, and it just showed the, the failing assertion in the end. But one nice thing that we can do here is we can introduce the verbosity. Um, Make it a bit higher, and what this will give you is like is like very similar to the ITF trace that I showed you. You will get in the terminal output, you will get the steps that kind of lead to the failure in the end. And we can also try to figure out what, what's going wrong. So we have this chain C here that's connected to two chains A and B via channels that have the same name. And as I said before, like once we add the assumption that these channel names are unique, we can verify that. Um, that's not the case anymore. Yeah, so thanks for your interest um, and happy question. to take any questions. Yeah. yeah, I have a quick question. Um, I noticed you were showing us, you know, chain state by typing eval statements. Are you doing anything to integrate in with the debugging framework so you can just see it with inspectors and that sort of thing, given that you're inside of VS Code? So, I'll, I'll take this one. Uh, so for the VS Code plugin, um, in the repo, you have some iterative states. So you begin with like an init statement and an init state, and you have transitions on top of them. So your state is changing all the time. And the value that's evaluated depends on that state. So yes, we could have some evaluations like that on the plugin, but only for the pure environment that doesn't, um, interact with the state, because once you have the state, it depends on the state that you are on, right? So that's uh, how you have the REPL. I have some questions. Um, so is this more of a like pseudocode language or spec language in the sense that like you can create um, uh, also the markdown files from the comments on the on the language itself, or even diagrams. So maybe I'll take this one. So initially, we had this idea of translating comments in, in this language to Markdown to produce readable, basically readable specifications that include uh, the pseudocode uh, specification language, right? Uh, but what we found later that actually it makes more sense probably to write markdown in, in the literate form where you basically add the quint parts of the quint code inside the markdown file and if you're interested we can show we can even leverage the existing tooling for for literate programming to uh, basically write down these markdown specifications and produce clean specifications out of these markdown files, which will be again executable, testable, and all that thing. Right. right. And, and yeah. And, and the language itself, it actually it has formal semantics, so it's a specification language, right? But uh, we try to make uh, its syntax accessible to engineers, basically. Right. So uh, underneath it actually has uh, a well-defined logic, it's based on TLA. But you don't see all of this stuff. You just see a nice syntax. Uh, the, the good thing to know is that there is a well thought out semantics underneath, you know, which you can okay. you can leverage other tools to to reason them out. Yeah, yeah uh, that makes that makes sense. Um, I guess I have a couple more questions. But so does this work as a uh, this language can work as a workspace? In that, what I mean is, let's say I have many specifications of different things in IBC. And some of them, like, or just different specifications, some of them use the same names for the types and stuff. So I want to import things in a way I rename things. Like, is everything already defined and sorted out, like this kind of things? I mean, it kind of just started, right? We have ICS 20, we have uh, some definitions for, for denominations. But if you want to have all the, mod, all the ICS specs, we haven't written them down, right? In principle, you could. You could or we could uh, write all the specifications and connect them. Of course, the question is, is how efficiently you could reason about them. And most likely you wouldn't be able to efficiently reason about the whole the whole thing at once. 
but if you if you use it more as a as a notebook or, or like a reference space for for architecture or whatever yes you definitely could do that yeah it's okay. just not, for the moment we have ICS 20 we have the definitions of denominations and and some some actions that basically describe how how the packets are flying around right yeah, yeah um I guess uh, so. I noticed that it's kind of uh, slow, uh, not just when you're doing the random non-deterministic stuff, but just slow. Uh, is there what's the reason for that? Yeah, it's just REPL. Uh, basically, we did an MVP, and we didn't have time to to do incremental compilation. So you see, when when you do when you do simulation, it actually doesn't have to recompile things all the time. But in REPL, it just since we didn't have time to optimize it, it, it does recompile things many times. That's the sure. source of slowdown. And it can yeah. be fixed for sure. It's not it, it's not a serious limitation. It's not doing any round trip to you know another continent or whatever. <laughs> okay. Um so also uh, how computationally like strong is the language? Like can I literally go on the internet, fetch stuff, like can I write a whole app in it? Like just what's the limits here? I mean, if you are talking about the logic itself, it's of course uh, Turing complete, everything is undecidable, and all these things, right? If you are talking about verification, um, you cannot you cannot fetch anything. The, the language itself is limited to to basically to the primitives uh, that we can reason about, right? It basically, you cannot connect external libraries, right? We in in the future we might consider an option to connect external code. But but the language is really designed for for writing down your specification, so it does not uh, it does not uh, get poisoned by you know all all the things unsafe things uh, like external dependencies or libraries. It, it's not a programming language in this sense, although it looks like a programming language, right? And and from the ex ex expressivity point of view, it, it's based on on uh, the logic of CLA, which is just super expressive, actually. You can have sets, nested sets, maps, uh, tuples, records, uh, what else, lists, uh, and you can have uh, some temporal behaviors. You can even express some uh, some uh, liveness and safety guarantees and, and fairness properties. So in, if you know some tools for, for verification, this is, this is more powerful, you know, the, the underlying language and underlying logic. Uh, but if you want to implement the whole system in it in the sense that you want to basically run it in a in, in a production environment, it's not designed for that. Okay. Um yeah. I guess um wait. Um so when you like there were like frames that were moving to the next iteration and stuff, is there like a specific uh like function for that like iterate like because you know you you could see like the real unrelate packets and then you can really like is there like a function that's called relay to like just iterate it one step or like uh, i'm just curious about the actual implementation yeah so so we have i can maybe i can quickly show this um, um so we have let me see where we have this so so you have kind of um we are still figuring out a bit uh, the best style to write this. So the language is there, right? But we're still figuring out the style. So what we currently recommend you do is like, you have um, a pure um, environment that is like full, purely functional that you can use. And, and we've tried this and it's very, uh, very straightforward to just uh, define your usual application logic, right? That's what I've shown in the beginning. And then um, for this ICS20 spec, what we've done is we've kind of wrapped them a bit in, in something that in Quint is called actions um, that kind of simulates the, the actual IBC logic, right? The, the general logic and the message passing. So here you can see an action um, that, is, that, that is this receive packet that I've called, right? And what we do here, so, so as you see, saw in, in REPL, I'm passing a source chain and a destination chain. And what's going on here is essentially um, 
so, so just fetch, I have this chain states that you have also seen in, in the wrapper, which is just this map from, from a chain identifier to its actual state. So I just fetch this for the source chain. Um, then there's a couple of preconditions, right? So, so we want to say, okay, this action is only successful if we actually have an existing um, IBC channel between source chain and destination chain. And also we can only receive a packet if there is an outgoing packet on the source chain, right? And uh, this packet is um, kind of destined for destination chain we're writing here. And then, as, as I said, when we ran the sim random, random simulator, we uh, non-deterministically bind one of, the, uh, one of these outgoing packets. Um, this is the same filter that you've seen before, except here now we call one off and one off is this like non-deterministic choice that will pick one of the packets that are in flight. And then uh, the remainder is very straightforward. So we call the actual pure definition of, the, of this um, on receive callback. We get back a result. This is like tuple valued. So, so we kind of like uh, assign this here um, to, to names to distinguish. And then the remaining thing that we do, because what, what Quint does at this point is encode the state machine. So we have to kind of like uh, define the, the next state that our, our, our state machine is taking. And so here we say, okay, we move, remove this packet from the outgoing packets. We move it into, a, in, into another set that is like packets that have been sent, but not yet acknowledged. And then we have um, a new, uh, and then yeah, on receive also includes the acknowledgement that was created by the on receive packet handler. And then we just say, okay, like now our new chain state is the source chain state updated, all of these fields updated with the new values. Um, that's kind of what's going on. And this is kind of, I think you have been hinting at this before. This is kind of implementing this like stuff that you would see in ICS4 or something, right? Um, so th there's these very light wrappers around the pure devs that contain the logic that actually contains how, how we simulate the message passing in this back. Yeah, uh, I, I, I get that. But wh where is the, that actual, like, literally frame? Like, you know, your code could tell where the, f like, one frame moved to another frame, uh, like frame four, frame five. Like, where is it actually written here? Oh, I guess uh, you're referring to steps. Thomas, maybe you can point just to, to the steps, right? Yeah, yeah, like, uh, uh I, I'm not sure I'm not sure I understood the question. No, no, you there, go, you there is, make... Yeah, there is this next state relation which we define in, in the step definition, in the step action. Okay. Can okay. you just show it? Show ah, okay. It. But there's so, so in ICS20 we don't we don't have a we don't have a step action. Um hmm. but if you take let's say we have this like we wrote this back for the nomination traces right that I showed. And there's just this the step hmm. action. Um um, and th this is actually, th this is all that's, that's going it. on here. And the tests, they, do, do tests have their own step actions or? So, so in tests, you, you kind of, you, you write, you, you write out one specific path, right? You, you right. specify a, a, a sequence of steps, a, a fixed sequence right. of steps that you take. Okay. Got it. Yeah. But technically you could also write, uh, steps in, in tests as well and the simulator is also using this next step uh, relation it just it will introduce like really a lot of non-determinism okay and like you said it compiles to tla as well i mean it doesn't compile to well it, it kind of compiles to tla when you when when we want to execute the model checker we are finishing this integration with the apalachi model checker and then it actually gets compiled into internal representation, which is compatible with TLA. So when it compiles to TLA, which is not happening in, in the simulator, uh, when it compiles to TLA, uh, you can use symbolic execution and symbolic model checking uh, to verify some properties. So let's say I write a markdown file and then I want to compile, like, uh, 
now it's gonna take the quint code from the markdown file and then it's gonna do everything uh so like do you just put quint on the code block yes uh, i mean there are these tools basically where you can can uh write in markdown that you want to add some some piece of the code to a specific output file and and then oh. you you run this tool it, it process markdown extra extracts all the all the quint files that uh, you specified inside the markdown file and then you you feed this uh these quint files to whatever you like to the simulator or to run the tests or to the ci so in principle you could use it in the ci or no, yeah so the idea is to use it in the ci and then it would put them on the same file and do everything and then the tests would be separate yeah i, I think one of the values is that actually you can use it in the ci to to see whether you have broken some things when you change the protocol, for instance. Right, and um, the, the the thing is, if um, I guess um, like because it's a custom language, I guess in some sense, like the the, the coloring for the Markdown files on GitHub would it like look right or like it would be annoying, you know, like to have like uh, incorrect like no colors on the on the specs. Yeah, you're right. So for getting our color or syntax file lightning to GitHub, we actually need some people using the language first, otherwise they won't let us. So um, perhaps like when the project is getting traction, that's surely there will be syntax file lightning. For now, we are just using the high lightning from other language that looks okay. It's just, it's, it's okay. It's called blue spec. So, but uh, as soon as we get enough repositories using a queen specs, um, we should, Submit our syntax I like need to GitHub and then they should approve and then everything good is good. So what's the first project you want to use Quinton? Ah, I mean we are already using it uh, for ACS20 and and if somebody is interested, we, we can talk and and uh, help you to with any problems you have with the Quint specs basically. Yeah. And if somebody is interested in, in basically feeding these JSON files into the testing frameworks, we definitely should talk. Yeah, that's all my questions. Do you have already some code to be able to parse these um, traces, the, the informal trace format, so that we can parse it and run tests in Golang or? There is a parser for us, and, and there is a parser in TypeScript, obviously, since we are parsing them. Um, but also, it's a very simple format. You basically read JSON, and you have to you basically have several cases. You are reading integers, booleans, uh, strings, arrays, which are lists in our case, and arrays that encode tuples, arrays that encode maps, and arrays that encode... Uh, I forgot what. Ah, and there are there are records that are using the object syntax. So writing a parser should be really, really easy. That's the whole point. Yeah. And and actually, actually, I think we also had some version of, of a parser for Golang. And there is already one. Cool. All right. Um, any more questions? Uh, yeah, so I guess a question with, um, I guess, like code reusability with this. So uh, right now you have ICS, uh, you have a spec for ICS 20 uh, written and you can test that. Um, if, uh, let's say we had, I guess, like a future spec ICS, I don't know, ICS 99, um, and I wanted to test that with this language, would I have to re-implement um, like IBC Go, um, sort of like how, how you guys are doing it, where um, you have all the uh, spec files written to send and receive packets, or am I able to import um, the, the code that you have for that? So this is something. So this is something we we definitely are exploring, right? So one thing is um, we expect there to be a growing number of Queen specs that that can be leveraged, right? Um, the second thing is um, 
yes, right now this message passing logic is kind of written more in an ad hoc way, but there's nothing stopping us from uh, like isolating it in a separate module. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out is, um, yes, this kind of like currently for this ICS 20 spec, there's like a little bit of overhead in writing these actions, but it's actually not that much. So we looked at some point, we looked at, we compared the line count of, of our quint specs and it's around the same number of lines as you have in the current markdown spec. So it's not, it's not tremendously long, even though it has to specify all of this like message passing stuff. Okay, but that for right now that would have to be rewritten um, if I wanted to, uh, you know, test out ICS ninety nine or something, right? Mm. So, so one thing is like yes, but so so one thing is you could definitely use the current ICS twenty spec as kind of a template, right, and just like rip out the the application specific logic. Um, the other thing we have been talking about, but um, there, there we would also be interest, uh, interested if there's like. Um, customer feedback that somebody wants this is to have more of a kind of like template for IBC apps, right? Where you kind of get a starting point to write your application specific IBC spec. Okay, cool. That's awesome. Excellent. And, and have you compared um, the spec that you wrote with the TLA plus model that already exists for ICS 20? like? Um, like complexity, number of lines of et cetera, stuff like that. Uh, Igor, do you want to take this? I mean, I think in general, if, if you compare it to TLA, the TLA specs are a bit shorter because uh, TLA is, is specifically designed to look like a mathematical description. So, so the screen specs are like, I don't know, it's hard to say what the factor is, but maybe like 50% longer because there are a lot of curly braces and, and the formatting makes it, you know, more spread out. Um, but but technically they're very similar because underlying logic is, is basically the same, although all the quint adds all nice, all nice, na nice things on top of it. Um, I mean, the thing that what what ha has been done differently in, in this screen specification, we explicitly have this separation between the functional layer that doesn't encode doesn't encode any non-terminism and and non-terminism on top of it that encodes the environment and how how the network is basically operating. So that I don't think it was there in the CLA spec before. Basically, we, we are trying to keep to keep this functional layer that should be close to, to the Golan code or to the Rust code. It should resemble this kind of code. Um, so they're kind of different, also because we are using a different different uh, specification style here. It should be again more accessible to engineers. Yeah, but yeah. I can compare the number of lines. We just didn't do that. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. We didn't do it, but, but but I think like from my experience in writing this spec is um, even though it's the same logic underlying, um, I, I think the, the important point is that Quint is much more accessible, right? Like with TLA plus, you always have this thing that you're kind of looking at this ASCII soup, there's a lot of backslashes and then the, kind of this latte um, um look, which is hard to digest. And Quint is, it's a bit more verbose because like the keywords are longer but it's much easier to read. And the second thing is, even though it's the same, same logic, what we have found internally is that people use a different style in writing their specs, right? Not, not everything goes into the state machine, uh, but you can have these, these pure functional definitions that are very nice to operate on, that, that don't touch any state, that they're super easy to reason about, they're super easy to write. Um, so it's really a different flavor of writing the spec. And, and um, I was thinking that um, um, maybe um, a good use of, of of this specification language could be uh, if you, if you create a specifications for like the transport layer, so channel connection, uh, that that code could be very useful as an as sample code for people that want to make new implementations of IBC, 
uh, sometimes yeah we get the feedback that it's difficult to to read the specs and, and know how to make a new implementation of IBC. Uh, so, so maybe this kind of specifications could could also be helpful for for guiding the development of new implementations. Yeah, that's that's definitely where uh, basically a uh, specification language could help. And again, the point here is that you can use uh, just in our experience, you can use this uh, the specification language and the specs. Uh, you can play with them, which makes it much easier to to understand what you are actually going to implement. Plus, you can always read the goal and code to understand what exactly is happening. But uh, having this ability to just quickly iterate and, and use a REPL environment, it, it definitely helps. Yeah. All right, we're 10 minutes past the hour. And anybody has any more questions or feedback? If not, uh, uh, thanks a lot, uh, guys, for the presentation. Yeah, this is really cool. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, looking forward for a future presentation at some time. <laughs> thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Thanks, everyone. See you in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.